start recording. Go ahead. Okay, our mission statement, Happy Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at the Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. And so with that, let's go ahead and turn it over to Mark, who will be introducing Tricia. He's known her for quite some time, and I'm just so happy that he's able to do this for us. So go ahead, Mark. Sure. Well, welcome, Tricia. I just wanted to let everyone know, who anyone who doesn't know me, um, I'm Mark Ireland. Elizabeth and I co-founded Helping Parents Heal a number of years ago. She's the president. I'm the chairman of the board. And uh, we're just thrilled that it's grown to this size and being able to help so many people. And uh, it's, it's uh, unfortunate there's a need for what we do, but uh, we're glad to be here to support everybody. Trisha and I have known each other for probably around 15-ish years. I'd have to check to yeah. make sure. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting how we met. It was actually back before there was a Facebook or, or even right. MySpace. Yes. Uh, you had these things called Yahoo Groups. And as I recall, I had recently um, gone through some, uh, gotten interested in all the, the research that was being done in the area of medium uh, research. And she was on the group, I was on the group and I would read these posts and then I would post occasionally and then I saw her name. And I remember reaching out to her when uh, I had completed my first book, Soul Shift and was about to get it published and I asked her if she'd write the forward and she did. So she wrote the forward to my first book, which I greatly appreciate. She also, so she must've liked it well enough to do that. Oh yes, it was very good, yeah. And then uh, I got her to, she uh, wrote a testimonial for the second book to an endorsement or review, whatever you wanna call it. Um, that was um, back in about 2014, beginning of 2014, so. Anyhow, I really appreciate you being here. So Tricia, rather than me telling everybody about your background, um, do you wanna just give them a quick bio on yourself and then I'll ask you a few questions? Sure. Um, hello everybody, hello. It's, it's, it's good to meet such a lovely group of people who actually know that the afterlife is a reality. It's unusual because quite often I'm on uh, Zooms where people don't actually believe. So I don't really have to convert any of you. I just have to substantiate uh, your belief or your understanding from my point of view. Now, I come from a non-religious uh, take on this altogether. I come originally from a more scientific background. I, um, I was a maths and physics teacher, and I was also a lecturer at Glasgow University. And for some reason, not through bereavement or any unhappiness at all in my life, I was married happily to my first husband. Uh, we had two, two children and two cars and a dog, the, the whole catastrophe. And uh, for some reason, I took an intellectual interest in life after death. I actually don't know why. Well, I do, know, I, I do know now because the powers that be up above, although I'm saying it's from a non-religious standpoint, I do know now that there, there's something working above us, guiding our lives. There definitely is, there's no doubt about that. And I was sort of drawn in to go to a spiritualist church and hear some mediums give readings to people in the audience. Now, I wasn't particularly interested at the time, but as I listened, my intellectual mind uh, said, well, I wonder if there's something in this. And from that point, I began to accost people in 
going out of the church and ask them if the reading they got was meaningful and I would take a few notes and from then on it escalated and uh, I was put together with Professor Archie Roy. We didn't know each other before. In 1987, uh, the powers that be once again, we, we obviously were puppets. They drew us together. And I worked with P Professor Archie Roy for, well, until 2012 when Archie actually died. Archie was a generation older than I, I am. And Archie, he was uh, an emeritus professor of astronomy, a very, very clever man. And I wouldn't class myself as a very, very clever person, but I have different skills. Um, we empathetic. So Archie and I worked together and designed experiments. And one of the experiments we did has was very, very successful of, over a five year period. And we had our results published in a peer reviewed journal, which means they're reviewed by people that are trying to find fault in your methodology. And I'm not going to explain it. It was extremely boring, but all the work was done double blind which means the mediums couldn't see the sitters, they couldn't hear the sitters, and the sitters couldn't see the medium. So everything was above board, kosher, and after five years of work, we had to conclude that good mediums, and this is the point, good mediums can provide excellent evidence for life after death. Now, the problem, as you all know probably, and Mark knows as well, is that not every medium is a good medium. And my rule of thumb is the more they want to charge, the more you want to avoid them. There are many, many genuine, ordinary, good mediums around, and it's finding them. Now, you are all very fortunate in that you're working through Elizabeth and Mark, and you're finding the best people. But me, there, uh, And so I'll, I'll continue with my own sort of story. I'll come back to that. So um, Archie and I worked together, we did experiments, we used to go on spontaneous cases where people had thought they'd things in their house, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You can talk about that later if you like, because sometimes they do have something in their house, but more often than not, it's someone who's passed who wants to come back and let them know that they're, they are all right. That's the main thing that really happens. So then Archie and I provided uh, lectures at Glasgow University jointly and separately. And then uh, before Archie died, actually, and I, we provided lectures, I had loads and loads of lectures on many, many different subjects, not only mediumship, you know, near-death experience, premonitions, uh, near death, once again, out-of-body experiences, electronic voice phenomena, all these sort of things which would lead as a package for us to think this is a different way of looking at life after death. There's more than mediums can actually point the way to us. So I knew I knew Archie wasn't terribly well. And, I, and then before Archie died, I actually started writing my first book because I thought I have all of this information, all of this experience, and it's not for me. I want to share these experiences with people who do not know that when you die, you don't. And it's, I wrote it for the ordinary man and woman in the street so that they would have the hope, they would have the joy, they would have the realisation that their loved one was not lost forever. And that is honestly my first, my first book. That was my intention for that. And my watchword, of course, is evidence. What is the evidence for this, that or the other? And based on evidence, based on my own experiences, that is why I wrote the first book. And then it went really well, and it's it's a very, very if I say so myself, it's a very good book. And then I had so much material, I wrote the second book. And now I'm on to my third book, which is actually bizarre. Not so much for helping parents heal, it's about bizarre for, for paranormal phenomena, which is really loopy. And if you didn't actually know that people survive, you would think I was completely mad because the, the the information in the third book is just bizarre, but it's all true. And most of it points to someone or something in the afterlife that's helping these things happen. And that, that's my reason for writing the books. And when I wrote the third one, the bizarre one, I didn't really think people would like it very much. But strangely enough, they seem to be loving it which is, was a surprise to me, to be honest with you, Mark. I thought that people would want to be based on the, the life after death. And uh, there is no doubt after all of these years, well, 30 odd years in 
investigating these things, doing experiments. I also did a five year study on healing. I, I don't call it spiritual healing or any, I just call it healing with people through either through intention or heal, he, putting hands on healing and healing definitely works. It can heal the body, it can heal the spirit, it can heal anything if the intention is correct with the healing. So I find it all so fascinating, but the problem is there is so much involved in each of these avenues. We, we call it psychical research of psychical research. that it's very difficult. You can't talk on a broad spectrum all the time. You have to hone in on one subject and look at that to, to the end and then another one. So that takes a very, very long time to do. And it depends very much on what kind of questions people would like to ask as what direction we might take with this conversation. I'm, I'm actually reading your newest book right now and I'm finding it very interesting. And even though it's not necessarily focused on- No, it's not effort, focused. Exactly. Or, or mediumship, it, it still tells the reader, hey, there's more here than, than you think there is going it on. Is. There's definitely it something is. more beyond this reality, this fixed Absolutely. physical reality. Absolutely. The other thing and I was going to ask about- Some of it's very bizarre and unreal, but it's true. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, Professor Archie Roy, a lot of these folks wouldn't have heard of him, but he was like at the very top of um, the science world in the oh, UK. Yeah. In fact, um, he, he was just not an average professor. And for, you know, usually a lot of the mainstream scientists won't delve into this because they're afraid of their no. reputations or what their right. jobs are. But he was yeah. at the very highest echelon, was he not? Yep. Yeah. He actually took part in the calculations for the first spaceship around the moon he did some of the calc not all of them but he, he was he was partly involved with the cal uh, the calculations for that so he was very very high up in astronomy yes very much so he was an astronaut oh, he, he, he did take a bit of ridicule from some of the other uh, scientists in the, uh, the astronomy department but he didn't he didn't care because archie actually sat in a very very good circle down in england before i met him the rita gould circle and Archie sat in that circle with an open mind. He did have an open mind and he would never come out until not long before he died. Archie would never come out publicly and say, I believe in survival because of his job. But he did believe in it. And he did eventually, once he retired, he did come out and say, yes, you know, it's a fact. Because he sat in that, I, I wasn't there, he sat in the circle with Rita Gould and some other people. And every time they sat in the circle, in a dim light, but not black, a little boy would materialize and uh, Archie was able to see the child. And uh, it was fairly dark, so they, they were given torches with red tissue paper over the top. And the, the medium would say, you, you may now shine the torch. And actually shone the torch downwards. And he saw a little boy's toes wiggling like that. And mm -hmm. the little boy said to him, see me wiggle my toes. And actually was, any time he went, this little boy appeared. And obviously it, there was no little boy in the room. He also had the Scottish medium, Helen Duncan, sit beside him on a sofa. Uh, she was dead, obviously, and when she sat on the sofa, even in spirit, the sofa bounced and actually nearly went through the roof. And she kept slapping them in the arm and saying, you can what I mean, Archie, you can what I mean. And Archie thought he was going to have a sore arm. But when he got home, there were no bruises. And she spoke to Archie for five or ten minutes. And he was absolutely convinced that he was talking to Helen Duncan, the medium, and of wow. course, and the little boy and all the other people who came through. So he was absolutely convinced by it. I've never had the good fortune to see that. Um, I wish I had, but I didn't. <laughs> but um, the, the work you did with him was very evidential. It was based on mental mediumship. Oh, yes, and yes. Maybe you could describe that experiment a little bit for folks just briefly, if you don't mind. Well, it's, it's, it's very, it's so complicated. I think you'd be bored hearing about it, but the point is we had three published papers from our work and those published papers are actually cited even by people in universities now in the in the psychology departments and that as to regarding good mediums information and quite a lot of the skeptics say oh you don't mention the bad mediums and I go, oh, why why would I talk about bad mediums I'm only giving you the best of evidence this is what happened blah de blah de blah 
are. And that's, that is, why would I give them bad information? I don't care about skeptics. They can say what they like because you and I know the truth and they're just not willing to open their minds. They really are not. So there's no point in worrying about them as long as we need, know the truth. Just need one white crow, right? One white crow, so William J William William James. Yeah, was it yeah. William James? Yeah, yeah. So for folks to, disprove, know... to disprove the theory that all crows are black, you only need one white crow. And that is why my publisher's called White Crow Books, because he very much believes in, in that sort of thing. But it's it's when you're doing uh, when you're doing the work and you're researching things and it's always something you haven't planned for that gives you that extra piece of proof if you want for yourself. I can tell you very quickly one of the early ones it was it was before I was married for the second time so it's a it's a at least twelve years ago I was in a different a different house and a woman phoned me up I don't know to this day where she got my phone number and she said my son's funeral is tomorrow and after the funeral i'm going to join him and of course i was flabbergasted and i said oh no you're not and she said what do you mean now i don't know if this is true or not but i just said it to stop her from committing suicide i said to her well if you if you kill yourself after the funeral you probably won't be in the same place as your son because it's not your time to go so she listened to me and i said stay where you are she was in england stay where you are, I will phone someone and I'll get someone to phone you back. And at that point, I hadn't a clue who I was going to phone. So I phoned up this very good Scottish medium, Helen Cuthel. She lives up in Fife. And I said to Helen, Helen, I need you to do something for me. I'm going to give you a woman's number. Her son's funeral is tomorrow and she is in a bad way. Will you please phone her? So Helen said in her usual Scottish way, oh, yes, Trisha, I'll do that. No problem. So about an hour later, I get a call from Helen to tell me that she immediately got the son in spirit. She gave the name. She gave the fact that the, the, the boy's brother had stolen the boy's sneakers after he died. He took the good sneakers off the coffin and put on the old ones so that he could keep the new sneakers. Now, <laughs> that's pretty weird for a start. She said, at the funeral tomorrow, there are going to be two black horses, and she named the horses. I can't remember now. You would have to read the first book to, to find out. And she gave a whole lot of information as to what was going to happen at the funeral. The person she would meet, she hadn't seen for a very long time, and a whole lot of information about the boy. And at, at this moment, I can't actually remember how the boy died. I'm not sure if he took his own life. I would have to look back, it's so long ago. Anyway, Helen gave this woman, oh, a lot of information. And I said, great, Helen. I said, would you do something for me? Stop talking and go find pen and paper and write down everything. The woman's name was Paula and tell, tell, write down every single thing, line by line by line, statement, 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 everything you told Paula. And, she's, and her husband was eight, he said, Oh, I'll make sure she does that. So Helen said, OK, then. So Helen did that. I then phoned back the first lady, Paula, whose son was going to my funeral. And I said to Paula, how did you get on with Helen? Oh, very well, very well indeed, she said. I said, Paula, would you do me a favour? I said, would you write down what you can remember now of every single thing that Helen told you right now on the phone? And she said, yes, she would do that. So I gave her. I gave her my address. So not long after I got a letter in from Helen and I got a letter in from Paula and everything that they said matched up as to what was going to happen. Now, the next day was the woman's son's funeral. So I didn't want to phone her the day of the funeral. But at night time, I couldn't resist it anymore. And I phoned her about 10 o'clock, half past 10 at night. And I said, hello, Paula, it's Trisha Robertson here. Oh, yes. I said, how did the funeral go? Oh, it went very well. She was totally and utterly calm. And from the minute she spoke to me, and then she spoke to Helen through me, that woman went on to become a healer, I think, as many of you have done. She was a nurse, actually, and she realised that she, it wasn't going to do her any good to kill herself after the funeral. And that woman has gone on to become a healer herself and has become a very well-balanced human being who knows that her son 
is not dead. His personality, his characteristics are still there. Now, I haven't spoken to her for a long time, so I don't know if the son is still keeping in touch with her or not. That sort of thing is a turning point. But one of the major turning points for me, I think it's in the first book as well, was an experiment that I did, not intending to do an experiment. I don't know if you found this, Mark. Sometimes you do your best work when you're not intending to do it. Something comes, everything I've done actually comes into my wake. I've not, I've not gone out to seek this. It's just things that have happened because I think if whoever's up there can use you, they will use you for the benefit of other people. And that's fine. I'm cool with that. But the major turning one for me as far as belief goes, I mean, I did know the evidence, I'd, we had done the experiments, all of that, but the thing that really sold it to me about survival was when a woman came to me, I don't know where she got hold of me, and she, she told me her daughter had been murdered six months ago, and the police were not making any inroad with it at all. <clears throat> now, I thought you want me to get a medium for you, but I'm not going to do that. If your daughter was murdered six months ago, it's too early, especially if the police haven't done anything with it. So I said, well, can you bring me something in a couple of days time? Can you bring me something that belonged to your daughter in an envelope? And she said, yes. So a few days later, I met her in a in a, in, a, in a place and she gave me this brown A5 envelope with things in it that it felt lumpy. Oh, it wasn't a ring, it wasn't a watch, it was just lumpy. And I said, well, I'm going to take this to several mediums and see if they can get anything from this. So I did that. I took it to a couple of, actually all mediums were male. I took it to two male mediums. One said, well, Whoever, the person that owned this was murdered and it's something to do with a black taxi. And the day she was murdered, she'd been to the dentist. I don't know. And the other person muttered something as well, but there wasn't anything terribly, terribly uh, evidential in it. So you have mentioned Gordon Smith and I, I will tell you. So I'm friendly with Gordon Smith because I respect him. I respect his work. He, he would never cheat, I would never cheat. And at that point, I was able to walk into Gordon's house. And the reason we're friends is we do respect each other. So I had this envelope, not getting any, much, much with it. So I walked into, go, knocked the door, come in. So I walked into the house and Gordon was sitting with a laptop in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And I, I go, oh, hello, Tricia. And I said, Gordon, will you do me a favor? And I plonked this brown envelope in front of him and he said do I have to and I went yeah and he wasn't happy about it he went okay because I don't ask anyone to do anything for me I never have I've never asked a meeting for anything never would never will unless it was something I maybe paid for for a stranger but I don't do that so reluctantly Gordon put one hand the computer hand on the envelope and immediately immediately his eyes popped open and he went Trish, I've got a girl here that was murdered. And I just went, mm hmm. But remember, I don't know anything about the murder. Neither does Gordon. She's telling me that her boyfriend was the first, and he didn't give a name. The boyfriend was the first to know I was murdered, and he phoned my mother. So I'm, I'm recording this, and I'm taking notes about it. And remember, I don't know anything. She's telling me she lived up in flats, one up on the right, and the, where the flats are is a cul-de-sac. That's a street with no throughway on it, if you, if you don't know that. She's telling me she misses her three cats. She's telling me she's got tattoos above her left breast and he described the colors and the shapes of the two tattoos that were intertwined. Described tattoos on the back of her arm. She said, the newspaper reports of, of the clothing I was wearing were all wrong. That is not what I was wearing when I was murdered. And she gave me a description of every piece of clothing that she was wearing when she was found murdered. Now, as I say, remember, I don't know any of this. She's also telling me that she, and it was like a three-way conversation. She's telling me that she had a termination of a pregnancy when she was younger. I'm writing it down. She's also telling me, and this is the one that clinched it for me. She's telling me that when she was younger, she was in Cortonville prison. And I'm thinking, good God, I mean, I don't know anyone that's been in prison, far less naming a prison. 
So I thought, well, that's either right or it's wrong. It's not a lucky guess. So I've got all these things. Um, oh, she's telling me that today, as we speak, my mother has moved my photograph from the top of the fireplace to the top of the television. Okay, writing it down. And I'm trying to remember what else he said. Anyway, all together, he, oh, she described, she said it was two men that murdered her. And she, she gave a description of them. And she gave me an address and, uh, and, and how she was murdered all down the back. Anyway, I, it, all together, Gordon gave me 29 pieces of information. And I didn't know if they were right. I didn't, might have been rubbish. I don't know. So I just thanked him and we had a cup of tea and that was it. So two days later, I made arrangements to go to the woman's house. I'd never been in her house before, and it's not near where I live. I went to see the woman in the house, and as soon as I walked in the door, I saw a photograph of a girl on top of the television. And I said, oh, is that your daughter there? Oh, yes, that's her there. And she said, I moved that photograph there two days ago, and that was the day that I was having the reading with Gordon. Now, the interesting thing about this from a scientific point of view is the girl knew that the newspaper report had given all the wrong descriptions of her clothing. She knew that the mom had moved a photograph the day I was speaking with Gordon. So it can't be mind reading it for me or Gordon because we don't know. So where does that information come from? And it can't even be an Akashic record or a digital library, as some people would have you believe, or super sci. It's too personal, absolutely personal. And to me, and now the clincher, of course, was then I said to the mother, I'm going to read you out some statements that I've gathered from mediums. I didn't see who or anything like that. And but I chickened out. I didn't tell her the girl had a determination of a pregnancy because I thought you might not know that. <clears throat> and your daughter's been murdered. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I didn't give her a description of the men that murdered her or the description of the murder. And I didn't certainly did not give her the address that I was given. So out of the 29 pieces of information, I told the mother, I asked her 22 questions. Every single piece of information was correct. 22 out of the 22 that I asked her. Now, and I, I hesitated and I said to the mother, eh, your daughter says she was in Contonville prison when she was young. She said, yes, that's right. She was a wayward teenager. And I thought, well, can't get better than that, can you? I mean, un unbelievable. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I chickened out with some of the stuff. I thought, I oh, know it's not my place to, to tell her the other things about the murder, etc. But I did find out later on that um, her injuries were all at her back. I didn't know that at the time, but I found so that was correct. And one of the other mediums did say a black taxi was involved and she was at the dentist the day she was murdered. And these two pieces of information were correct, but it's not enough, it's not enough information for science to take two pieces of information from one medium. But you know, it doesn't work as far as statistics and things go. And that was my own experience that really sold me on the totally on the fact that loved ones know what we're doing. They come back from time to time to tell you. She just wanted to let her mother know that she was okay. And as far as I'm aware, I never saw the woman again. She seemed to do, to do pretty well after that, but uh, there was never a solution to the actual murder. But the point is she knew her daughter, she knew that her daughter was, was okay. So that's the kind of thing that keeps me going. That's the kind of thing that I enjoy sharing with people like yourselves and it's the truth and for anyone to say that's not true it just means they're calling me a liar now i don't i don't do that i'm black everything's black and white the statements were either absolutely true or they were wrong there was no in in between thing that's why i don't like readings that have got an assessment in them mark to be honest with you they've either got to be specific right or wrong for me because i'm a black and white kind of person. I know that say uh, maybe not the right way to be, but you've got to be careful with assessments. That's the problem. And we always get these wow moments with mediumship. And after Archie died, of course, Archie died in 26th of December, 2012. And uh, I had gone to a local, by that time there was a small local spiritualist church, very small. But I, I went to the churches because it was around the corner. 
And I didn't go to hear from Archie because I knew Archie would be okay. I really didn't go to, uh, I wasn't sad when Archie passed because it was his time to go. He, he, had, he had dementia and he didn't know people. So it's a blessing, you know, when, when they actually go. And in that church, I, I get such a fantastic reading from a wee Glasgow medium who would not know Archie died. Nobody in that room would know Archie had died. And I got a fantastic reading that showed me that Archie's sense of humor, his personality and his intellect had survived uh, in, tremendously. Now, the interesting thing is, now I know that you're all talking about young people, but Archie pointed out that when you've got dementia or Alzheimer's, you're more in the next world than you are here. You're floating between the consciousness you go to when you die and the consciousness we have here and now. And Archie said that when you're in that state, you've been up and down to the spirit world so many times that when your physical body actually goes, it's like stepping into the next room. You immediately know where you are and there's no confusion. And I find that very, very heartening for people that have dementia family. It's a wonderful thing to know that, that they're actually absolutely fine. That's wonderful. Yeah, it I was. I loved it. Loved it. Um, and what you've described in terms of your experience is similar to, well, I, I grew up with a father who had these abilities. Yes, so I know your dad. Child, yeah, I know. Yeah. From the time of being a child, I, I was convinced early on because I saw him give specific reading information, yeah. the first yeah. and last names and all kinds of that type of information in an unsolicited way um, in public settings and so I had that comfort level. A lot of other folks had to you know, learn later on. But then as an adult, I kind of rediscovered all this. And so yes. one of the experiences I had similar to this, which I won't tell the whole story because it's too long, but it was quite similar in that uh, a medium friend of mine, Deborah Martin, was going to meet with me one afternoon. But that morning I was at work and had learned that a coworker in California, her brother had died and she needed to talk to me. And um, she... I did connect with her on the drive to Deborah's house and mm -hmm. she had told me that her brother died in a motorcycle accident mm -hmm. and she was worried about his kids. And that's all she said. Mm -hmm. When I got to Deborah's, uh, Deborah said, well, it's no, it's no accident that you're here today because I'm supposed to talk to her. And, mm -hmm. and so she gave me a short reading and all I knew again was that the brother had died and she gave me a half dozen or more pieces of information mm -hmm. that I did not know. And then on the drive home, I was I confirmed, and they were specific pieces of information. Yeah. So similar. And I know Elizabeth had the same thing with Suzanne Wilson before she ever knew what a medium was. Someone mm -hmm. that was going to rent out space to Suzanne in Scottsdale or Carefree or Cape Free. And um, the the landlord was leery of it and wondered, you know, well, I want to see if this woman's legitimate. And she goes, give mm -hmm. me a picture of someone. And somehow she had a photo of Elizabeth. I don't want to tell the whole story. If I'm wrong, correct me, Elizabeth. But she had a photo of Elizabeth's son, Morgan. And again, she gave a uh, half dozen or maybe a dozen mm. specific, mm -hmm. highly mm -hmm. specific, highly personal pieces of information. Yeah. So yeah. to me, that's that's just about the gold standard for mediumship today, other than Absolutely. correspondence experiments, which are crazy. <laughs> yeah. As I say, I, I'm basically a mathematician and a scientist, and I come from an, a non-religious background, which is actually good, because if you've got indoctrinated, really religious beliefs, it can be quite difficult to, to come out of that. So I'm fortunate in that way. You, but there's, science is not the only way to go. As I say, with these things that happened to me, I know, and, and I was not emotionally involved in any of these things. I was a kind of a third party who was able to, to share in this. And another thing that I did with Gordon Smith's first book, I can't remember what it was called now. Gordon said to me, would you come? It was at Waterston's a bookshop in Glasgow, big, big shop. And Gordon was going to a, well, launch the book. It was a book launch. So Waterston had arranged a, a small platform, very small platform where we could look down at the audience and uh, Gordon said to me, would you introduce me, say a few words, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, sure, Gordon, no problem at all. So I have to say it was a very small platform, which is room for Gordon and I and, and a microphone and no more. So I got up and, and, and Waterson said it was the biggest number of people they'd ever had at a book launch. And that was before Gordon became known all around. The people, you know, local people knew how good Gordon actually was. 
So I, I'm introducing uh, Gordon, etc. whatever I said, I don't know, a very short introduction. And uh, then I introduce Gordon Smith. And of course, Gordon Smith is a very ordinary person. He doesn't have any airs and graces. He doesn't put on any fancy names for himself. He just immediately goes into it. And I can't remember any of the other messages, but I do remember we, we were high up looking down in the audience. And I do remember him saying, I'm coming to the lady with the blonde hair, you know, he pointed back a bit. And this woman eventually looked up. And he said, and he, he said, I have your son here. No questions. He said, I have your son here. He, he took his own life and he's here to, to say hello and let you know he's all right. And he said, he's wearing his baseball cap and he's lifted off and he's showing me for short hair. And the woman started to laugh. And she, she looked and they had this conversation about the boy in the hair. And she was always threatening to cut his hair off, you know, before he actually died. And uh, this was him saying, look, mum, you know, I've got I've got my hair cut. And I can't remember the rest of the message. It wasn't my message. And he went on and but ended up with the woman laughing. The woman came because her son had committed suicide and she ended up laughing. And, and we were all laughing with her, which is not really funny. But we all ended up sort of smiling because she was happy. And that was fine. And he gave other messages, which I cannot remember. And then he did a book signing. And then Gordon said, we're going round to the pub round the corner. He said, come round. And he said, just a few of us, you know, and we'll have a drink. So we went down to this, round to this lauder's bar. And it's, the people had arranged quite a big table, just a big a rectangular table. Not an awful lot of seats, maybe 15 to 20 seats. And of course... I, sat, I just sat down anywhere and I knew one or two of the people, but I didn't know the lady beside me. And it, then it dawned on me. And I said to her, are you the lady that got the message about your son with the, the, the cap and the hair? She said, I am. She said, and then after two years, it will be the first night's sleep I've had in two years. She said, I've been to cruise, which is a counselling thing. She'd been to the church. She went, she was a Catholic and she went to the priest. And the priest said to her, oh, your son committed suicide, he'll burn in hell forever, which is a lovely thing to say, of course. She had been to various counselling services and she said, tonight is the first night that I will have a night's sleep. I know my son is, is OK. Now, how wonderful is that? That's wonderful. Awesome. And that's Amazing. why we have all these discussions in our group. And that's, that's why, why we, we have these. And these, these are the kind of accounts, I don't use the word story, these are the kind of accounts that we, we all should be sharing. And because I come at it from a more scientific background, I'm not saying I'm any more credible than anyone else, but it took me a long time to get to this stage. And the fact that I didn't come into it through bereavement it is a good thing. Uh, I've, had, I've had to learn at, from all and all the different subjects I covered in the books, they all come together. Mediumship is only one small part of it. And for all of you, that's the main part. And we all of us, every one of us, even myself, until I got my wow factor, I thought to myself, am I, am I crazy? Am I thinking these things are true and they're not? But when you look back, and then I, I have to go over in my own head all the things that I've seen done researched etc and they say no you're not crazy this is a fact and th this is a thing with a lot even the good psychical researchers they have to keep and I, I do discuss this a lot in some of the books even the very best of the highest ed educated people way back for the last hundred years every time they come across something that they know is true but it doesn't match up with their mindset normally we call that cognitive dissonance, where there's two different things you know to be true, but you can't marry the two things together. And I think it was a French psychical researcher, Gelly, and many others who said, if I hadn't seen these things with my own eyes, I would never have believed them. Even now I question myself, but I know what I saw, that kind of thing. And that's why it's difficult for the ordinary man in the street to realize that these things are true. But with the things, I only deal with what happens to ordinary people in real life, what happens to them, their experiences. Well, that's one of the things I do. And uh, to me, there's no finer thing you can do in life than to give other people, not just hope, 
but evidence, proof that you've survived physical death. These horrible skeptics, even the likes of, I know Randy's dead now. I wonder, wonder if he knows he's dead. <laughs> I was just wondering about that. <laughs> I only found out about his passing maybe a couple of weeks ago, but I guess it's been, what, six months ago or so? But, oh, it was less, I think. Things less. Yeah. Um, but he was, he was he's got some karma built up i think i don't know that's just oh, my I, I, I i i i that that is his problem yeah uh, it definitely is his problem but uh, everybody reaches their own level of course when they go over to the other side you you gravitate to the place where you're comfortable there's a very one of the first books i ever read i don't know if you any of you have read it it was called On the Death of My Son. Now, this is long before I knew you, Mark, anything like that. Right. It's called On the Death of My Son by... Jasper I mean, Swain. Jasper Swain. I think I recommend, maybe recommended that to you. Yeah, and you he was, I never um, found a copy, but yes, I remember you recommending it. Yeah, well, I managed to get a copy of it. Uh, I, if I find I've got two copies, I'll send it to you. And he was a total agnostic absolute total the son of it was a car accident and the son uh came up he, he came back and told them he'd come out but before the car actually crashed he'd come out of his body he could see the car crash and he could see his own body there but he said i'm not there dad and then as time went on the boy came back again and again to describe and i do describe i think it's the first book i can't remember what the boy said to his dad there is no heaven there is no hell you gravitate to, if you want to think of it as light illuminations, how bright something is, you, you, you go to the brightness that suits your eyes. And if you go, you, he said, I can go up a bit higher, but the, the, the light is too bright. And sometimes I have to come down to my own level. And he said, I can go down to the lower depths. But he said, gee, dad, I don't like it there. He said, it becomes quite creepy and I've got to come up to my own level of light again. So once again, We've got this uh, movement of where the consciousness lies and what levels of consciousness that people are at. Then, of course, you've got Emmanuel Swedenborg, who was able to, to go up and down in the spirit world and see all different kinds of levels. I just hope I end up at a fairly, fairly high one. <laughs> I don't want to be down in the dark side. <laughs> Well, it's interesting with Swedenborg, too. He, he gave a description of basically quantum physics before there was any quantum physics being Correct. researched. Correct. So he, he knew that intuitively. Mm. Um, now we're going to have to wrap up as soon as I can get some of these questions out, but I have two more quick ones for you. First off, okay. is, is parapsychology just a new name for psychical research or is there a difference? No, not at all. Parapsychology started in universities when people went to university to do psychology, ordinary psychology. Now it is changing now. I don't know about America. I don't know. But certainly in the UK, when they did a psychology, then they looked at parapsychology. Let's look at why people believe these things happen. You know, they thought there was something wrong with your psyche if you thought these things happened to you. And I won't name any names. There are still certain people there at Edinburgh University that still will not be on, on our side. They just won't take that leap. Now, there was a professor there called Bob Morris, and he was wonderful. Bob Morris started the Kessler unit in Edinburgh University, which was for psychical research, but they lumped it into the psychology department. And once Bob Morris died, they took the money that Kessler left and they put it into ordinary psychology. And all of us, eh, Rupert Sheldrake, myself, we were all Archie, we were all livid and showed how immoral that was to take the money that Kessler wanted for afterlife investigation into ordinary psychology. But nowadays, the ones that are coming through now, like Professor Chris Rowe, Cal Cooper, David Saunders, they are now investigating more. They're now actually beginning to realize these things do happen. And instead of thinking we're all Looney Tunes, they're now actually beginning to try and look a wee bit more scientifically. They've also got a room in Stansted Hall, which is a spiritualist place to set up experiments. But uh, it's all, university stuff is fine. And that is great if you have a repeatable experiment. But the real work in this is done in psychical research where you go out and see what happens to real people in the real world because all of this and it doesn't matter what we're talking about all of well most psychic phenomena even poltergeist activity genuine ones 
it all requires emotion and uh, intention and motivation. Your, your people have passed over. They want to come back to speak to you. They don't have to. They don't have to come back and say, hi, Mom Elizabeth, how are you doing? Uh, and if eventually they might have, they have all got work to do there. They might stop coming back. They might come in from time to time just to let you know they're still there and they still care. But most of all, they want you to know that they're OK. And most of all, they want you to lead your own life. They don't want you to spend your time worrying about them or what has happened in the past. You go forward, take the words, the, the truth and spread it to other people, which your organisation seems to do wonderfully how many people have you gotten in the healing uh, your group helping parents heal has what fifteen thousand. Yeah. it's many? almost 16 now it's uh it's uh 15 800 wow but we have um affiliate groups in in the u.s in canada the uk south africa now as well as india and in uh, new zealand and australia and wow. we're going to be having one soon in finland so we're and we have six different languages that the caring listeners are able to speak with parents. That's amazing. That's, charge. That's yeah. amazing. Sorry to break in. I, I know that sometimes if people contact me for that sort of bereavement thing, I always say, go onto the internet and I give them, you know, your name so that they can contact that organization. And I'm sure you treat them very nicely, whoever comes into your wake. Yeah. And you've got the experience, so you're the best people to help them. Absolutely. And if they speak French, you can steer them to Elizabeth. Voulez-vous parler français avec moi? <laughs> oh, see, I see. Oh. Um, and Mark is so learning what? well, too. He's, he's picked up French as well along the way. So he can also. My throat is stunted. I need some help. <laughs> we better dive into this question. I'm afraid I only speak very bad Spanish, and that's it. <laughs> so I'm going to plunge into the questions that have been posed. Yes, please do. please do, please do. So the first one comes from Debbie and it's, uh, what is your opinion? Uh, can a loved one be stuck here for a while due to, a sudden, to passing suddenly and not knowing they had passed? It, it, it is technically possible, but if you think of all the people who are killed in wars, whether blown up, uh, you know, into, into smithereens, and there are, there are so many um, accounts of the people coming back before the family actually know that person has died in a war. They come back to tell them that they've actually died. Um, it is possible. And that is why some people have what you call rescue circles, where they try and reach the people who are stuck just because of the shock of being in, in limbo, as, as it were. And they, but someone will eventually come and talk to them and reach out a hand and bring them through to the other side. It is possible, I'm not going to tell you a lie, but it's not common. Most people, when they pass, there's someone there to take them through immediately. Now, some people can hold themselves back deliberately because they don't want to go. Uh, for some reason, they, they, it, you, it's usually people that are kind of jealous people, they're frightened to leave their worldly goods, you know, money, etc. But eventually, everybody eventually goes. <clears throat> Most people pass immediately and there's, there's not a problem, but it is possible for them to be stuck. They're, I always think of looking down to earth rather than looking up. And that is why I have a, I'll give you an example. This is maybe not an example that will cheer you up, but I can give you another example. I have a tape, and it was a, a, into my, in my possession, which is a circle like that. Well, it's not a circle, it's a minister and a reporter, where it was during World War II, it was down the north of England, there was a, a, an RAF station there. And during the war, there was an accident there. Well, we didn't know this at the time. But when that war was over, they cleared the RAF station and they made it something else. It was, I know what it was, it was a construction industry training board uh, where they train all these big guys that have got all the cranes and all the big stuff, the hard hat, big roughy toughy guys. But they'd kept one of the old hangers and they made it into squash court for the, 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 these workers. But they found that nobody was going into the squash court. And, and they made inquiry and eventually they found out that people didn't like going and they felt somebody was watching them in this, in this uh, squash court. So eventually uh, um, they said to a minister, could you come and see if you could feel anything? So the minister's wife, he was an English minister, 
Church of England minister, but his wife was a medium. So the minister and his wife went into this and the, the wife said, oh, there's something here. There's definitely, there's something here. So they came back with a recording devices, some witnesses, and the wife was a trans medium and the wife was able to go into trance and you hear the minister speaking and the wife goes into trance and she starts to speak. There's no point in me telling you what it said because it, it was very, very faint. But the person came through and gave three names, Dusty Miller, Pat, something or other, and Jerry Arnold. And they said that they were stuck there. Their plane had crashed there in water and they were stuck and they were still cold and shivering. So anyway, the minister, the minister, you can hear all this in the tape. The minister says, well, bless you, Pat, Jerry, and uh, I've forgotten the other one's name uh, at the moment. And he said, now, turn your head up. Do you see a spot of light? No, no, we don't. Yes, you look up, you will see a spot of light. And eventually they said, yes, there's a small spot of light. Well, draw yourself towards that light. Draw yourself towards it. And... I never noticed it for years after having this tape, but as soon as the minister said, draw yourself towards the light, and there was a silence, there's this whoosh kind of noise, and, and then another whoosh again. I thought, I never heard that before. And then the minister said, I think they've gone now, I think they've gone. And then another voice came through the woman, and this voice was like a godly voice, a very glorious voice golden voice and said thank you for your intervention this has been much needed for 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 a long period of time god bless you and thank you so much for your work and that th it was fine it was cleared but why they were stuck there and why they needed an intervention i don't know and that was a sudden death because they were young uh, and they were all killed together in the same plane i don't know but be assured most people go no problem at all, as you can see with Jasper Swain and all of the other things we've spoken about. Now, but you have to cases, be aware. Sorry? In some cases like that, is it could it just be residual energy rather than an actual soul? No, or? Not, it could be, but not in this case. Right. But, yeah. but in some cases. Once it, we come back to emotions and feelings with all of this, right? Oh. There are certainly cases where, where, where there that is... I, I call it like a, a video recording on the space and time rather than residual energy. That that doesn't mean anything. It's rubbish. It's like a it's like you can watch Elvis Presley on a video, but he's not actually there. But you feel as if he's there because you can see him. And uh, in these other ghostly things like old battles, I discuss this in the third book actually. Um, in, people can see reenactment of old battles, even to flaming torches and everything, but they're not there. That was something that happened and I call the space and time. And that is just like a recording on the space and time that's there. No, no, this this was the real thing. They, they, their, their spirits were stuck there, but they'll be fine now. They'll be okay now. Okay, we have some other questions I'm going to try and hit real quick before we just wrap it up here. This one's not really a question. It's more of a statement. I think she's just looking for you to comment if you want to. It says, I only feel my son... And think everything is my son, but my daughter feels a dark, heavy, bad presence sometimes. Well, I actually can't answer that because every case is different. I would have to know the people. I'd have to be in their house. I would have to speak to them, find out what the daughter thing might be absolutely nothing to do with with the woman's son, uh, unless it's just the daughter's own grief feeling that I, I, I couldn't give you an answer on that because yeah. I would need to see the people and talk to them. Yeah, I figured that was a challenging one there. So the next yeah. one is, why don't we just return to the oversoul? Why do mediums say my son grows up across the veil when he had previous lives? So we're uh, getting into theoretical stuff here. Which we're we getting really... into theoretical stuff now. Um, people say that when people pass as a baby, they do say, I have heard people say, your, your baby's growing up in the spirit world. I have no um, knowledge Obviously, it's not going to stay. It's not a baby anyway. If a baby dies, the baby's got the soul in, inside inside itself when the baby's born. The soul, the consciousness, is that baby goes back to the spirit world, and it's not. It's then not a baby anymore. It's it's whatever consciousness that is. And they may, I believe, there are schools there. They get taught, and they do come to maturity. 
but I, I don't have an answer for that one either. I don't yeah, do theories. That was Nadia asked that asked that. Now Carol Hennessy asked the following, or she's stating the following. Uh, and you can comment on it if you want, or she, she's not really asking a question. It's we moved to Savannah, Georgia almost six years ago. Since landing here, we have seen a young girl around six years old with a white dress, blonde curly hair, just a beautiful child. She talks, sings, dances, and laughs in our backyard. We have become used to her hanging around. Maybe they just want to know if you've heard of cases like that. I don't know. There, there are there are some cases like that uh, where where the child is laughing and telling jokes. One of my own friends, uh, her little boy, used to talk to a boy with a very unusual name in the back garden. I can't remember it. And uh, his dad said to him one day, "Who are you talking to?" And he said, oh, "I'm talking to." And it was, oh, it was an unusual name, really unusual. And the father said, "Don't talk such rubbish." And the little boy said to Kenneth. Well, I'm not going to come back anymore," he said. Um, "I'm making you making you unhappy." And oh, Kenneth was he was very very sad that this little boy never came back to see him. That little boy's chosen to come back to Kenneth, but the boy's fine. He would just go back to where he should be. That's not a problem at all. He's just chosen to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is from Doris Aquavina. This is something I've answered a bunch of times, but I'll, I'm curious to hear your opinion. What time frame would you suggest to see a medium after your child crosses over? It's very much horses for courses. I wouldn't go in the first six months because it'll be too raw for you. Um, but I would certainly give it six months anyway. What would you say, Mark? I usually say three to six months, but no yeah. sooner than three. I have seen cases where someone's come through within a day or the, you know, like with- right I, Can I jump in here? And I, I went to see a medium two days after Morgan passed. I was in wow. a really good place when Morgan passed because he had hugged me, but he was so present at that reading. And so I think it really depends on- I think it sitter. depends. Yeah. It depends on, um, it depends on a lot of things, but I don't think that people should hold off from going to see a medium if they feel ready, because um, I think it all all depends on whether or not we are yeah. wanting that. Um, but I, I just wanted to quick say that because I hear that a lot, but I do, I, I did go two days after. It was my whole but, family, actually. But, but what, what, what age was your son when he passed? What age was Morgan? He was almost 21. Uh, yes, you see, he was a, but he was a mature, he was a mature person. The question was, if, if you lose a baby or a, a young one, uh, it, I, 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 the answer is, as you say, it depends very much on the person, but more than that, it depends very much on the medium that you go to see. If you go to see a poor medium, it can make things so much worse. And that's why they really, you know, they should go through your organization to make sure they get a good one. It would oh, be yeah, awful yeah, to get, yeah, yeah. Be awful to get a bad reading. Be awful. No, That's I so agree a hundred percent. Yes, Mark. You're, I mean, Mark is doing such a great job of making sure that the mediums that we have are wonderful. And yeah. um, so, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't want to break in there, but no, 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 I agree people. with you. Yeah, it's like it's like you know, there's 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 no hard and fast rules. That's why I see everybody's at a different level, a different place of understanding, and it depends very much on the individual cases. But uh, certainly, I, I would say, uh, uh, of course, your 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 boy was growing up as a child. I would leave a little while just for well, that. Well, I had a daughter who passed when she was two days. Oh. And I felt her come through almost immediately. Oh, that's lovely. As well. So that was a long time before that. You so must be very sensitive. I've been very, very fortunate to have yes. very good experiences with this, though. And good. I feel um, I want to just reiterate to everyone here that uh, our recommended providers are on a page on, helping, on the Helping Parents Heal website. The providers are not recommended by Helping Parents Heal. They are recommended by parents. So they have uh, recommendations that were written by parents. Some of them have up to eight or nine of those recommendations. Great. And many of them have been certified by Mark Ireland. Some of them in the beginning weren't, but we know that all of them are excellent. So anyway, yeah. sorry, sorry to break in. Just wanted to say that. Yeah, well, I can see, I can see there that a lady's written, she felt guilty for not feeling her, the person that passed immediately, please don't feel guilty because one, it, 
I think that Elizabeth's actually quite sensitive herself. I think you might be quite mediumistic. Please don't feel guilty because sadness and grief can cloud you over to anything. And uh, you will feel that person or they will make themselves known when, when the time is right. I am not mediumistic at all. And everything I get is done in the form of electronic stuff. It's always electronic things that let the people, let me know that the people are, are actually there. So please don't feel guilty if you don't feel them right away. Poor old Jasper Swain, the man in, in South Africa, he didn't believe in, in this at all, but when the, immediately the boy died, but that boy must have been a very, he was 21 or 19. He was, um, obviously quite a mature soul and he was able to come back straight away as i say there are so many variables please don't feel guilty about anything you will you will hear from them or you'll be told through a medium when it's right for you it could be far too soon but uh, you're doing a great job there elizabeth x and mark of course i think the key is what it boils down to is the emotional readiness of the person who's the sitter absolutely yeah and then getting a good medium you know Definitely. I've seen people who jumped ahead who were not emotionally ready and went to a bad medium and it was a and catastrophe and I tried absolutely. to stop them but they wouldn't listen. Car um, crash. So, yeah. 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 It's a shame. I know. This is this is why we have to go as much as we can on, on evidence. And that's a good thing that uh, the parents have recommended the mediums they've been and uh, they're getting good recommendations. That's excellent. Excellent. Uh, I think it's right. a wonderful organization and 16,000 people. That's a lot of people. Yep. Very good. Here's another quick question. I, I have my answer to this, but I'll ask you, why won't some mediums allow recording? Uh, recording well, of the reading. Who, well, who knows? Uh, who knows? That's entirely up to them. If a medium doesn't allow recording, I wouldn't bother going to them. Yeah. My, my guess is they're, they're afraid maybe that you would share that in a public setting or something. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's no. entirely up to the medium. Any any yeah. good medium will, will give you a recording, yeah. And Kate asked, uh, why would you not personally consult with a medium? I don't think you you meant that you wouldn't go to a medium, but rather that you, like your relationship with Gordon, you're not going for your yeah. own interest, right? It's oh, I, 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 did, I did go to mediums before I started to do anything in this. I never asked for this, by the way. If you'd asked me 30 years ago, would I be doing this, standing up, giving talks, universities, lectures, I would have thought you were mad. But... Uh, as I say, if Spirit have a plan for you, they have a plan. And I'll very quickly finish with this. Um, I went, I, had, I told you I had gone to this church and heard Mejim speaking, and I thought, I must try one of these readings. So I booked a reading with somebody I didn't know. I was a, what I would now call an older lady, um, a very nice sort of a granny type of lady, and I didn't know a thing about it at all. Um, so I walked in the room, and as soon as I walked in the room, this lovely old lady said to me, you've never had a reading before, have you? And I said, no, I was, I knew nothing. No. She said, well, sometimes that could be difficult, but we'll see how it goes. So she started to give me this reading, and she did bring through my father. My father died when I was young. And she broke off immediately like that, she and she looked at me like that, and she said, one of these days in the future, she said, you're going to be standing up in front of thousands of people talking about this truth. And of course, I just looked at her <laughs> as if she was mad. And uh, she said, I won't be here to see it. She said, but boy, when you speak, will they listen? Well, I, you know, I didn't even think what, look, I just shelved it. And then she gave me some other kind of reading. And then I booked another reading another time with a man who was a record producer who had become a medium. In fact, he produced Paul and Barry Ryan for anyone that's old enough to remember Paul and Barry Ryan. Can't remember what they sang. And he gave it up uh, to be a medium. And he, he said, I work in a different way. He said, I like to hold your hands across the table. And of course, I said, fine, you know. So once again, at that time, my dad obviously was looking for me to go to mediums. And he, right away, he got my dad. And he my dad said things that were just absolutely unbelievable through this guy and then suddenly the medium sort of jerked his hands away and he said your father's telling me I've held your hands long enough and but he gave me so much good information about my mum and my dad and he said the re is, your dad's telling me that the reason your mum is not married again is 
not so much out of loyalty, but she just can't be bothered. <laughs> And that was just my that's just my mother's nature. She went, oh, I can't be bothered doing that again. And that was a good reading. So I have had readings, but I haven't gone for consolation readings. If you know I me, mean, if somebody dies, I wouldn't go specifically for that. Um, but, and it's not because I don't want to, but I just keeping on the path. And I'm um, I, I'm tempted at the moment to go to someone who claims to do trans sittings. So the reason I would go is to see if it was genuine. And of course, I'm never bad to mediums. I would give them every opportunity to be genuine. And because I'm very much down on mediums that just talk normal, average nonsense. You know, you're going to be sad this Christmas. Well, who isn't, you know, kind of thing. Yes, I saw a lady there saying that this group had actually saved her life. And I'm sure that you've saved many people's lives. And I'm sure, Mark, through doing your good work, you've obviously helped yourself as well. And you, you know the truth, you know, your son's fine. Yeah, when you serve others, it comes back to serve you as well. No, absolutely, no absolutely. And I think the point here that she was trying to get to and is that you, like your relationship with Gordon Smith was a professional one. And oh, he absolutely, knew, totally. And you weren't coming to him for personal reasons, but rather- Not at all, him. never have, never. I, that, that's a minor lie. I had a, I, I was in the room when Gordon gave Archie, Archie Roy a reading, but you can read about that in book three. It's quite a spooky one. Archie said to me, oh, it must have been about 2010. Uh, oh, no, no, it was, no, but 19, 90, maybe two, year 2000, something like that. Archie said to me, I need a reading with Gordon. Now, he was like me, he never asked anybody. I need a reading with Gordon and I'm not going to tell you why. And I said, well, that's okay. This is when I was, it was before I was, no, it must have been about 1999 or something, I don't know. And uh, so I invited Archie and Gordon up to my flat and I said, well, Archie wants a reading, I've no idea why. And Gordon said, okay. I said, but I'll make dinner for us all, you know, in the other room, I'll set the table, we'll have a meal and a glass of wine. So they, when they both came in, I said to Gordon, do you want to do the reading first? Or I always said, oh, we'll do the reading first and then we'll have you know, have dinner after. So I, uh, there was quite a good space in this room. Archie was sitting at one side. Gordon is an, was on another sofa over there, about seven feet away. And I stood as far back as I could with a tape recorder, recording all the proceedings. And Gordon um, started to give Archie, I didn't know why Archie wanted a reading. And I'm not going to tell you why you have to read the book. But Archie's, Gordon started to give Archie a reading. He started to go, <coughs> He said, something choking my throat. And Gordon couldn't get what was happening. And then I, as I looked, I could see Gordon. I've never seen him in trance. Never. Didn't know he could do it. And he was suddenly taken over. And I had a high back sofa. And he, he went right back in the sofa with his eyes shut. for oh, a few minutes or seconds, you know. And then his persona changed. Eyes were closed the whole time. And he stood up again with a completely different persona. And for 20 minutes to half an hour, Gordon spoke in the most immaculate English you could possibly imagine and addressed the situation that Archie was wanting to know about. But the first thing, it was a woman, the first thing she said was, I have had to come as my medium speaks such nonsense. And I thought, well, that won't go down very well. Anyway, Gordon gave a reading, well, Dominica gave a reading to Archie, and I still didn't know what it was about, but I had an idea for about um, 20, minute, 20 minutes to half an hour. But the, to me, the, the English was impeccable and Gordon does not have impeccable in English. He's a, a wee Glasgow boy. And then then Gordon, Gordon came back again and he, he said to me, wow, Trish, he said, that was amazing. He said, I've never seen spirit as clear as that. He said, I couldn't hear what Dominica was saying, but I could see as clear as day, all the people lined up more or less at the top of my sofa, all the people as clear as day lining up, you know, who were going to try to get through. And that was an experience for him. That was the clearest he'd ever seen actual spirit people. But I'm not going to tell you the rest. You'll have to read the book. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, just to let everyone know, we actually have on the HPH website, um, there's some videos. And one of the videos I made sure we had on there is the Psychic Barber Part 2. 
which yes. includes one of the experiments that Tricia and Archie were, were involved with. So I'd encourage you to check that out. It's really good. And you'll learn a little bit more about Gordon in the process, because I think he's yeah. probably truly one of the best mediums in the world from everything. Oh, I he is really. Yeah, he is. He is. OK, just we'll get through a couple quick questions, because I know we need to wrap here. This one is another theoretical one. So um, uh, from Tina Pinder. Personally, I feel soul agreements make sense of the things that happen in our lives. It makes sense that all the chaos of all the chaos. Do you share that view? I wonder if I'm crazy, too, because I can't believe in the experiences I'm having since my child's transition. So I think she's talking about like the idea of soul agreements or maybe pre-life planning. Is that something you- I think there's an element of that. Yes, I think there's an element of that. And I actually do think that quite a few, say disabled people come deliberately to be disabled so that you have the, you have the opportunity of looking after them and loving them. I actually do think that is a distinct possibility, but it's theoretical, of course. Right. Elizabeth, we have a few more minutes. Should I tackle more or do we need to wrap now? Well, we usually wrap at the hour. So we've gone 15 <laughs> minutes over and I feel badly for Tricia because she's in a time zone where it's pretty late at night. But um, again, we can have Tricia come back and ask her more questions next time, which would be fabulous. And we I could, truly appreciate it. Sure. We, so could, for those we, we could discuss a different topic completely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? So for those of you who had a question and didn't get answered, maybe save that for next time. We'll have Tricia back and we'll do it um, one more time. And uh, you can ask it at that time and we'll make sure that it's answered, if at all possible. And we so, always um, ask people to unmute themselves and say thank you and goodbye at the end of the meeting. So uh, you all should be able to do so. And um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're a lovely thank person. You thank, thank you. And you, Doris. Doris. Thanks, Tricia. Well. Great to see you again. And um, I'm sure that we will see you again and have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful afternoon for the rest of you. And we'll see you. We'll see you soon. OK, take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for and you're welcome to un you can unmute yourselves. <laughs> you're welcome to do so. Anyway, <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. We're waving. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I. Um, oh, you know what? I'm not letting you. OK, now you can. <laughs> I the oh, okay. so now they can have a good day everyone thank Sorry. you okay. take care <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Trish and Mark. okay bye everyone bye.